The year is 1414, and a legendary creature has arrived in um, Beijing. Almost said Berlin. <laughs> uh, this is during the reign of the third Ming Emperor, Zhu Di. Uh, the creature, known to the locals as a kilin, which is one of the four sacred animals, the others are a dragon, phoenix, and tortoise, uh, is known as a harbinger of great peace and prosperity. Has very long legs, a long neck, and eats only plants. This is uh, a copy of calligrapher Shen Du's rendering of the beast. I really love this image because it's that, that moment of vertigo where you're seeing something familiar, a giraffe, in this unfamiliar context. Uh, the animal came to China as part of tribute coming in as a result of the treasure voyages of Zheng He. This guy. This is Zheng He, admiral of the Yongle Emperor's treasure fleet. Uh, he was seven chi tall and five chi at the waist. <laughs> that means nothing to you. So imagine seven chi is about here and five chi is about here. So uh, a very large imposing figure by all accounts. He was a cunning military strategist uh, and also a virtuous pious man. Uh, he was known as the three foundations, three virtues, um, God, I'm forgetting the word. Anyway, he was so trusted by the emperor that he was given blank imperial edicts to take on his voyages to make orders while he was out. Um, so he was born the son of a Mongol official. Uh, at age 10, there was a huge civil war. The dynasties changed. Uh, all the Mongol officials were killed. Uh, unfortunately, this meant that his whole family was killed. Um, yeah, uh, and then he was pressed into service as a court eunuch at age 10. But, but our man reacted to this trauma, right? Instead of, as some of us would have done, gone internal and sort of checked out. Exactly, thank you. Um, he took it as a kind of fuel and continually escalated his entire life. So while he was at court, he learned to read and read all of the Chinese classics, your Confucius, your Sun Tzu, and he accompanied Judy, the future emperor, in every battle after, being, after joining his service. Um, now we have to skip several decades. There's a lot of stuff that happened that I can't talk about because it's not uh, exactly explore, but, oh, so, Casey wants to know about becoming a eunuch. The ceremony <laughs> was performed with a sword. So, just like chop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, there was, uh, so we skipped several decades. There is a conflict because there's a new emperor who is not Judy, and he is killing off all of his relatives or otherwise taking them out of power, kicking them out of China or whatever, and Judy is the last one standing. And the current emperor is listening to all of his uh, Confucian advisors, this will be important in a minute, who are telling him that he needs to consolidate power and uh, take out his uncle in the north, Judy. Um, Judy doesn't like that, and so he marches on the capital and takes the emperor. There we go. Um, so, he's, he's a brand new emperor, freshly minted, and uh, his mint is empty, and he also needs to consolidate power to show off, to fill the treasury with tribute, and also establish trade relationships within the region, which the Confucians were super against, and I think that's part of why he does this, is because he's kind of pissed. Um, so, he builds a whole fleet of ships, a bunch of junks, 1,500 of them, the largest of which was 440 feet long. The one you're looking at behind me is only 250 feet. Uh, so these are the largest wooden ships ever made. Um, there were ships for horses, ships for fresh water, granary ships, and about half gunships. 
um, or troop ships at the time. Um, the first voyage had 30,000 crew and 300 of these ships. There was no larger fleet assembled of any kind of ship until the 20th century in the First World War. Uh, it took three years and the majority output of bamboo, silk, and wood that China produced. It was a big country then, too. Um, next. So, after three years, this is an engraving of the first embarkation. So, uh, the first journey starts. They go down the Chinese coasts, port hopping. Um, then go around Southeast Asia. They skip around Java. So if you remember that part of the world, and in the next slide there's a map, so hold, hold on to that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they skip around Java and then go to the Indian coast, down around all the way to Calico, which is where we get the name for the fabric as well, for reference. Um, they hang out there for a few months. They set up supply depots along the way. And then they head back. And my note for this slide is just pirate battle. So if you're waiting for the exciting part, we're there. Uh, so the reason they skipped around Java to the south instead of the north is right where that red X is, there was a whole city owned by pirates and they had their own fleet. It was only about 20 ships, but they were all pirate ships. <laughs> that should be a new callback. Can I point out the X? Yes. At the bottom of the screen. Where it, uh, Stead. Thank you for the assist, Dean. Uh, okay, so right on the X, there was a pirate king, and he had 20 of his own ships, and he wanted all that treasure so he set up what he thought was a trap. Only our man was ready for it. And he set an ambush of his own and burned all the pirate ships, saved seven or so, captured all the other pirates and took them back to China to be executed. He installed a Chinese friendly king in the city, which is Palembang. Glad I remember that. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, the area was safe for trade. They went through the Straits of Malacca on every subsequent journey, and it was great. Uh, so there's this theme of, I, I see in his life, of escalation, of like, what can I do next? What can I do more? So on the second journey, instead of just tribute, they brought back an actual king to the court of the Yongle Emperor, the third Sultan of Brunei, whose name was Abdul Maid Hassan, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Uh, Hassan unfortunately died in Nanking, um, but he already had a son, so there was already a ready king for Sultan of Brunei, and uh, that is the same dynasty which is still there today. If you know the rich, like people with all the gold, Sultan of Brunei, same family. Uh, so, this is a picture of his tomb in Nanking. And the Chinese emperor promised 10,000 generations of friendship between their countries. I think that's working out pretty well for Brunei, still. Uh, so he escalated more and more with every journey. Um, he had temples and mosques built at every port that they stopped at regularly because he was a Muslim and also worshipped other gods. Um, and he ended the this, like, S sweeping set of journeys by bringing back a mythical creature that no one in China had ever seen. So, on his last journey, uh, they went all the way to Africa, and on the way back, he died at sea in 1433. Uh, so this has kind of a sad ending. Uh, not because he died at sea doing what he loved, which I think is actually fitting, but because the later Mongol emperors started listening to their Confucians again, and many of the, epper, uh, many of the records were burned or lost uh, to history. So we have a few first-hand accounts and the accounts of everywhere they stopped, but the official numbers and all of the record-keeping that was there is gone. 
So scholarship is ongoing. There are lots of open questions. Um, definitely all of the facts that I've given you tonight might be sort of flexible. <laughs> because, because we're inferring from, you know, records of other people. In any case, I'd like to raise a glass to Zheng He and always pushing the limits. <laughs>